working on this summer. Um, I got pretty excited about it. I think it's really neat. And um, I think it's kind of original. Um, so I'm excited about it. And the idea is to try to understand what is the most singular singularity you could have. So I'll make that precise. Um, see, I just joined. You can see that. <laughs> By the way, I mean, if you share the whole Jamboard, everybody can like be in it and scrolling back and forth as they want. How, the I, how, how do you share it? Do I just give, do I? Share the link for it. I could, I can make it so anybody with the link Share. Anybody with the link? Anybody with the link? Only people added. I'm making it. Yeah, yeah copy that link and then post it in the Discord. Yeah. Only people added can open the link, it says, though. Oh, that's a pain. All right, never mind. All right, let's just. Uh, what, what is that? There it is. There's the link. But can you Can you open it? No, let's see. Nope. It doesn't seem to want to let me do it. So anyone with the link, unless you're at Michigan. Yeah. I think you'd have to manually add all of us. And I don't think that's, that's, that's not worth it. Not yeah. worth it. All right. Sorry, guys. Let's just, let's just talk about it and advance as we go. Um, so, okay. Ravi's adding people maybe. I uh, nope, trying and it failed. So okay, great. I will. Yeah, can you can, see the screen. We can, we can post it later and figure out how to turn it into a PDF and post it. That'll be easy. Right. Um. Alrighty. So, I wanted to talk about this idea of trying to identify the most singular singularity, and um, it started actually at one of these projects. I was asked to be like a group leader for like a, you know, young people working on things, and I thought, well, let's study cubic surfaces and characteristic two because they're kind of weird. And um, out of that, I came to realize that they are extremal in a very precise way that we can define and that we can apply in many situations to define what it means to be the very most extreme singularity that there is. So here I put some pictures of singularities. The left is supposed to be not very extreme. <laughs> and they get more extreme as they go along. But let me tell you what I mean. Um, so I just advanced, Ravi, to the next page. So um, for simplicity, let's always just, in this talk, talk about um, hypersurfaces. So we'll just talk about one equation. Just like on that previous slide, those were all hypersurfaces. We're going to fix one F. Are you supposed to be, are we supposed to see what you're writing? Oh, no, that is writing. Okay, cool. Sorry, I was slow. I started talk talking without writing. So I have to take one F and it's going to be for simplicity. You know, it's a germ of a function on an algebraic variety, if you like, or you can think of it as a power series. But for concreteness, I'm just going to take it to be a polynomial. I'm going to assume that the ground field is algebraically closed. None of this is really necessary. I'm going to assume that I'm focusing my attention on the origin. So this has a singularity at the origin when I look at the hypersurface. In other words, I'm thinking F is in the ideal generated by X1 through Xn here. I think I wanted to use the N for this number of variables. All right. And so we want to understand, like, how do I measure the singularities of this hypersurface at the origin? And the very first measure of singularities that students learn is the multiplicity. So let's just recall what that is. So definition, the multiplicity of F, of course, at the point we're interested in, so at the origin here, or at the maximal ideal, is we just look at what is the highest power of the maximal ideal in which my hypersurface lives, right? So the order of vanishing at the origin. And I, I could write that this way. It's the supremum over the D such that F is an M to the D. That's familiar, right? The multiplicity. I don't like not seeing my audience. So, okay, thanks for the thumbs up, Taylor. <laughs> All right, so that's the multiplicity. 
And because I just want to make it super concrete, and I'm going to be interested in talking about only, um, only homogeneous equations. Let's just point out that if f is homogeneous, if f is homogeneous, this is just the degree. at the origin, the maximal idea. All right, so higher multiplicity hypersurfaces are more singular. For example, we all, we all know, right, that the multiplicity is one if and only if it is smooth, f is smooth at m. And as the singular gets high, higher, the hypersurfaces is vanishing to higher order at the at the origin and it's more singular but um not all multiplicity d singularities are created equal right so for example here's some examples of multiplicity two singularities just in two variables in the plane uh the, the least singular we could have would be for example uh, simple normal crossings. So we could have, you know, x, y, zero, barely singular at all. Or we could have, um, well, this is almost exactly the same thing. If I zoom in in analytic coordinates, this would be normal crossings, right? At least if the characteristic isn't two. Care not to. It's more singular in characteristic two because in characteristic two, it's actually cuspidal. So let's look, we can like this. And that cusp is more singular than the other two, right? And then we could also have even tighter cusps, like it's going to be hard to draw this very accurately, but I don't know, y squared minus x to the 17. That's even more singular. So all of these are multiplicity too, but these are getting kind of more singular as we increase, as we go from left to right here. Um, and all this at the moment is just thinking kind of intuitively in R or in C, but let me just point out that in characteristic P, these are not even equally singular if I fix the equation, right? So for example, y squared minus x cubed is more singular in uh, characteristic two than in the other characteristics. It's also more singular in characteristic three than it is in characteristic five and so forth. And maybe I'll make that precise in just a moment, but um, one thing uh, you can probably imagine is that, you know, if you try to compute derivatives of this equation, you get lots of derivatives being zero where you wouldn't expect them to be in characteristic two or characteristic three, for example. All right, so what we want to try to do is come up with a better measure of singularities. I'm advancing to the next slide. And I'm, you got to forgive me, I had to let the cat out of the room. <laughs> you might have heard him complaining about the talk. is relaxed, I guess, since we couldn't get started properly. Um, all right, so are, are people familiar with the log canonical threshold? I can't see faces, so it's so hard to know. I see a thumbs up. I'm going to go with that. So um, let me just remind you very briefly what it is. Um, so the log canonical threshold, I'm on page three of the Jamboard. Log Actually, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I think I would not assume everyone knows what the log canonical threshold is, but I think you're about to tell us anyway, so. Uh, I am going to tell you something. Actually, this is one of my very favorite topics to talk about, and I wish I had time to tell you more about it. Um, but I'll tell you some things about it. So this is a numerical, in, so this is first of all only defined in characteristic zero. So for, let's think of a, let's think of a hypersurface over the complex numbers. And this is a numerical invariant. Of the singularity F. So when I say the singularity, 
finding the origin on our hypersurface that we're focusing on. And the, the, the quickest and easiest way to define it is we look at the real valued function, one over norm of f. So an analyst would look at this and see this as a function on R2n, right? We have a, here we have a polynomial with complex coefficients, and it's in n variables. So it's defining a function on R2n. And of course, analysts don't care that it's not defined at some points. Um, this isn't defined where f is zero, and it's blowing up, right? It's going to infinity as we approach the, the hypersurface f, and it's blowing up even faster as we're approaching places where f has more singularities, where f is vanishing to higher order, for example. And so what we can do is we can ask, well, how fast does this blow up in the sense that when does this integral converge? I can take a little ball, a little neighborhood. Let me take an epsilon ball, say, around the origin. Is that the right notation for an analyst? Maybe it's the other way around. The center is the origin, our singularity. We have an epsilon radius. I should say there are no analysts welcome here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter if I use the right notation for a ball of radius epsilon around the origin. Um, and I can ask whether or not this thing converges, right? And it may not converge, it may blow up. And so I can dampen it down a little bit. I could say, well, let's put a little um, coefficient on this. How did I switch to blue? Was I blue on the other page? I was, I see, I did switch to blue at some point. That's all right. So what, what we can think about is that constant C there. If I put it, if I kind of think about a C axis, here's a C axis, I can put different positive numbers in for C, and if I put a very, very small C, I can really open down that growth and it'll converge for very small C, for C very small. And if C is very large, it will diverge. And so there's some cutoff point, canonical threshold, where this integral converges for larger C's sorry, converges for smaller Cs and diverges for bigger Cs. So in other words, the log canonical threshold is the supremum. Oh, you know what? I have my little right in the way of putting this neatly. Let me just the other way. So we're going to take the supremum over all C such that this converges. This is the definition of the log canonical threshold equation F at the origin, right? Because we're doing this around in the little neighborhood around the origin. So this is also called the analytic index of singularities. Actually, I think the reciprocal of it is called the analytic index of singularities. Um, but this is a um, important invariant in birational geometry. And let me state some properties of it just so people kind of know what we're going for. So it is an invariant of the singularities. In, so if I replace F by an um, isomorphic F, you know, do a change of coordinates, I would get the same number. It's always in between zero and one. Should we think that this is um, uh, uh, an isolated singularity or can it be just any kind of singularity? You can definitely focus on that case for your understanding, any singularity. We define this thing regardless. That's definitely an interesting case to keep in mind. Um, and, or, you know, if F, if, if F is smooth at the origin, then the log canonical threshold is one. So it gets smaller for more singular things. Um, oh, sorry, log canonical threshold equals one. I should have written log canonical threshold of F equals one. Um, let's just see what it is for a normal crossing support divisor. So if I have a function like this, a polynomial like this. Now that does not have an isolated singularity, Ravi, but it's pretty nice. Um, here the log canonical threshold is the minimum of one over this. So as we see larger A's means more singular things. It means smaller log canonical threshold. Now here's what I want to compare it to the multiplicity. 
So let's say if f has multiplicity d, so if the order of vanishing at the origin is d, then this log canonical threshold will be wedged in between these numbers, if I have this right. For this, I might need an isolated singularity. N is the embedding dimension, the number of variables. <clears throat> well, that's right. Okay, so these are some properties, and, and the intuition here is that smaller log canonical thresholds mean more singular. Singularities. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Absolutely. So the equation x1, x2 would just have LCT1? Correct. So it wouldn't like distinguish it from a smooth? Thing. No, this is not an if and only if. In fact, let me add that in here. The log canonical threshold of f is one, if and only if, F has log canonical singularities. That's actually, you can think of it as a definition, if you like, of log canonical singularities. We can think of that C as the cutoff at which we become log canonical. Um, yeah, good question. This is not distinguishing what's singular from what's not singular, but it's giving us some kind of a measurement of singularity. All right. Um, Actually, Karen, so, is there another example of log canonical singularity that you could just show that's not simple normal, that's not normal crossings? Yes. The cone over a uh, conic or any degree two, any degree two isolated singularity. Doesn't even have to be isolated. Um, so I don't have time to explain more about this particular invariant because I want to get to all the exciting characteristic P stuff. But um, one thing I can say is that there that you can compute this from a resolution, a, you know, a resolution of singularities. So we can compute this. You can compute this from a, a, log, a log resolution. Of F. So in other words, here in Atkins theorem, let's recall what it says. I just love this so much, I have to tell you, even though it's not particularly relevant. So if I, this is gonna be a, 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 a proper birational map. X here is a smooth complex variety. Pi is proper birational. And everybody, I hope in the seminar remembers here in Atkins theorem. Here in Atkins theorem says that if I, if I, I can always find such a map where the pullback of F will be um, a simple normal crossing divisor su support. Simple normal crossing support. In other words, in local coordinates, in local coordinates, it looks like Z1 through Zn, hey, like that, where Z1 through Zn are my local coordinates on this smooth complex variety where I resolve the singularities. And so locally, it'll look like that. So um, moreover, here in Akka's theorem tells us I can do this in such a way that the Jacobian of pi, the Jacobian, the complex, like thinking of this as a map from a complex variety to a complex variety. Sorry, this is Cn here, of course. So F is the surface in Cn. The Jacobian of pi also has simple normal crossing support. When I, when I add it in with the um, pullback of F. So I'm going to leave that as an exercise time to talk here. And actually, if we have a resolution of F, or you might say a local monomialization of F, then we can compute from that because this proper map means I can check the convergence of the interval uh, of the integral by changing coordinates and checking it there 
And using this, you can actually come up with a formula for it. And it's kind of neat. It shows that the log canonical threshold is always a rational number, which isn't obvious, I think, from this analytic definition, where it just took a supremum of some numbers. And, but that follows from thinking of it this way. So if anybody doesn't like the characteristic P stuff and get tired, I guess nowadays with Zoom, you can just Zoom out. <laughs> but in a, if we were in a real seminar, you could sit here, you could actually try this exercise, see if you can compute this thing, even in some simple case, we know a resolution. We're show theoretically for any F that, that you always get a rational number for this supreme, this log canonical threshold. All right, um, does anybody have any question on that? Because I'm gonna move on to what we would do in characteristic P when we don't have integration or resolutions of singularities necessarily. How about we go to page, the next page on the Jamboard and I'm gonna define the F pure threshold for you. So this is supposed to be an analog of the log canonical threshold in characteristic P. So now I'm, instead of taking a complex polynomial, I'm gonna take it in um, and variables where K has characteristic P. And when K has characteristic P, I have the Frobenius map, of course, and I can raise everything to P powers or P to the eth powers. And I'm going to let m to the p to the e be the notation for the image of the maximal ideal under that Frobenius map. So e is just some natural number here. And now, thinking about how we talked about multiplicity, instead of using powers of m, I'm going to use these Frobenius powers of m. And I'm going to look at the following. I'm going to look at when is F in a Frobenius power of M. And not just F, but in power of F in a Frobenius power of M. And I'm going to look at the set of all N over P to the E. And such that F to the N is in MP to the E. So there's a set of rational numbers, and maybe it's not completely obvious, but it does have an infimum. And that is how we are going to define the F pure threshold of F. I think about it is it is the supremum such that Fn is not in. M P to the E. It's actually not 100% obvious that those two things are equal. It takes a little bit of commutative algebra fooling around to see, but these are the same thing, the infimum or the supremum of those two sets. Those are, this is, this is a fact. So um, your intuition here, it's, it's, if you're not used to characteristic P, it's a little tricky. But the intuition here is I can think of my polynomial ring sitting inside of a polynomial ring where I've added, this is actually an isomorphic ring. I just add the pth roots of the, the variables. This is like basically the Frobenius map here. And now what I'm thinking about is more or less when does f over p to the n wind up in the maximal ideal. Does that make sense? I can write F as an arbitrary polynomial. I can take its P to the eth roots and I can think of it in this ring. And then I want to know when does that thing vanishing at the origin? So it's kind of a fractional power of F. You know, it, when we were looking at the analytic side of things, I'm going to turn back the Jamboard. Um, Robbie, can you turn the previous page? Look how we have fractional powers of F. When we're dealing with real valued functions, we can take fractional powers of F. You know, that, this is the norm of F, so that's a real number. I raise it to the 2C, see some rational number, or some real number. That makes sense as a function. In, in algebraic geometry, I don't do that, but in characteristic P, I kind of can. 
you can go forward again. Um, go back to page four. Here I'm taking this fractional power and I'm asking, in quotes asking, right, that that vanishes at m. Of course, that m is the ideal generated by x1 through xn, but I'm allowing here coefficients in, let me call it r1 over p to the e here. I'm allowing coefficients now with possibly fractional, you know, they could be p roots of things. So I don't know if that helps at all, but anyway, that is kind of how I think of this invariant. We're looking for the um, supremum such that this is not in there, such that this fractional power is not in the maximum ideal. All right. Um, let me rewrite this so you see what I mean. I'm just saying Fn is in here. If it's Right, those two things are the same, P3. All right, so this is a number. It's um, maybe hard to understand if you haven't seen it before, but it properties, because that's really what we're interested in. These are all things that can be proven. Some are easy, some are hard. Um, so first of all, it's a positive number. and it's less than or equal to one. And um, actually it's easy to see it's less than or equal to one. Let's just think about that to get our head around the definition. Because notice F is in M, right? Because <laughs> we're assuming it vanishes at M. We're assuming it vanishes at the origin. And this tells me that one over one is in the set of all N over P to the E, such that F to the N is in P to the Oops, my jam board is not letting me write on it. Let me wait, write this down lower. Right, so one is that, and we are taking the infimum of the elements in that set, of the n over p in that set. So the infimum is less than or equal to one. One is in there. Right, so the if F pure threshold is the infimum of that set, so it's one, so this is less than or equal to one. And just like on the previous slide with the log canonical threshold, if F is smaller than zero, it implies that the F pure threshold is one. And actually, it doesn't characterize smoothness any more than the log canonical threshold did. In fact, the, the F pure threshold of F is one, if and only if F is F pure. And what that is, I'm gonna put it in a little bit different language. It might be more familiar. This ring is Frobenius split. Does anybody know what that means? It means the Frobenius map, the yeah. P power map splits. I would guess that, yeah, there would exist people in the audience who know what it means, and there would exist people in the audience. Yeah, Probably it's not super so important at the moment to know exactly what it means, but what you should think of it is a Frobenius split singularity is one that is somehow controlled compared to an arbitrary singularity. And this F pure threshold is measuring it. I mean, it's detecting it. The F pure threshold detects Frobenius splitting. And the definition of it is not as important at the moment as the fact that we're measuring the singularity somehow. Um, so, uh, so actually about that is it, so this is not a local you're, you're, that on the right hand side that's a global oh, statement not a local statement sorry it's all it's all it's all local at m it's all local at m uh everything is i should put maybe a subscript m and this is at the maximal ideal and then is there some i mean is there it makes me want to think that there should be some character some property of varieties that says that all the local rings are Frobenius split. Yes. Uh, that, but whatever that means, I mean, that should be a, a thing. Yeah. But that's locally not a Frobenius thing. split, we call it locally Frobenius split. That's a good name for it. Yeah, or F pure. F pure is another word for it. Um, and that's why this is called the F pure threshold. I apologize for the notation in the language because F purity arose like by different people than the Frobenius splitting people. And then later we realized they're the same if you look at it the right way. And so there's two words for everything. Um, but I thought maybe for baby splits more familiar, so I use that word here. All right. Um, 
And what other conditions? All, all those things I had on the previous slide are the same. So the extra threshold of uh, normal crossing divisor or support, normal crossing support divisor is the minimum of the AIs. And that's actually not too hard to prove. I, I, mean, I think I'm more or less out of, you know, I don't want to take up your whole afternoon um, proving that, but it might be cool to see some proofs. Um, that one is not too bad. Um, and as before, we also can see that the multiplicity gives us a bound. So one, the, the, the long canonical threshold and the FPR threshold should be comparable to each other. And they should both be compared to one over the multiplicity. The multiplicity is a number, it's a positive integer and it gets, you know, larger and larger. It's not in between zero and one. To make it in between zero and one, I turn it upside down. And so I have one over D, I, I have the same kind of a comparison as before. This is just a general comparison like we had before. These are all pretty easy things. So this is the number of variables or the embedding dimension divided by the multiplicity. Um, all right, so yes. Um, do you want to see one proof with this thing or should I get to my theorems? <laughs> I, I don't know how much you like to see proofs or do you want to get to more things? I feel like proofs are good to see, but I realize time is finite, so you could pick to see whether you Yeah. Yeah, um, let me show you the proof in a very special case, just so you have one proof of the flavor of this thing. Gonna prove that um, if f is homogeneous, let's keep it simple, of degree d, then the f pure threshold of f is greater than or equal to one over d. This is easy, and my main theorem is going to be a much harder version of a stronger statement along these lines, proven with much harder analysis. So let's just do this baby analysis to get this easy thing. So this is what I'm going to do. Let R E be the following integer. I'm going to mul multiply D, 1 over D, by P to the E. And I'm going to round down and I'm going to subtract 1. So that's an integer. And uh, Robbie, what page should we be on right now? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on page 5. I'm sorry. Thanks for keeping, keeping us honest. Thanks, Julia. I'm just doing the simplest of um, proofs here that the F pure threshold, and this is at the origin, we're thinking about everything local, um, of a homogeneous polynomial degree D is greater than one over D, just so you can get a flavor. Very simple thing though. So now let's look at what is F to the R E. This thing has degree, equal to Re times the degree of D, which is D, sorry, the degree of F, which is D. And this is less than or equal to uh, multiplying the same P to the E minus D minus, uh, that's good. Right? Because the round down of P, the round, the round down of p, p to the e over d is definitely less than or equal to p to the e over d, and then I'm multiplying by d. And this is less than, strictly less than p to the e minus one. Let's make d greater than one here, because we're interested in singularities. And so this is not in, so it can't be in, it can't be in m. Its degree is too small. Everything in here has degree. Everything in here has degree at least. Has degree greater than or equal to p to the e. The generators have degree p to the e, right? And so this tells me that r to the e over p to the e is in the set of all n over p to the e where f to the n is not in, is not in mp to the e. You guys remember how this goes? We were interested in the supremum of the set, right? And so the supremum is less than this. 
the supremum is the F pure threshold, and that has to be greater than or equal to RP to the E over P to the E. But let's look at this number for a minute. This is P to the E over D over P to the E. This is a truncation a truncation of one over D in base P. So if I write out, if I write out one over D in base P and truncate it after the each spot, that would be this number. So these numbers are approaching, these approach one over D from below as E goes to infinity. And this tells me that the supremum of this set is, this tells me that the supremum of this set, which is the F pure threshold, is greater than or equal to the supremum of these specific R to the E. This is not R, this is a subscript or E. Greater than one over D. Does that make sense? This is like freshman year, honors calculus analysis. It was a ton of fun to do that this summer in a ton of arguments, because it doesn't usually come up in algebra, but there's so, so much of this kind of thing. So and I just wanted to give you a flavor. This is the most trivial of proofs, but this is kind of the flavor of how some of the proofs go. All right, I want to tell you a very interesting theorem now. Forward another page. Well, that was just a that proof to give you a flavor of something. And I, I want to tell you a comparison um, between the log canonical threshold and the F pure threshold. I mean, it's interesting. You could see that they seem to be doing the same stuff. So maybe it's not surprising. Um, but this is a really interesting theorem, which is I'm going to state in a very simple case. Let's just take an F with poly polynomial coefficients, sorry, with integer coefficients just to make it concrete and simple. And of course, I can think of it if I want to as a complex polynomial. And as a complex polynomial, it has a log canonical threshold. I could also reduce it mod p. So I can look at fp, which means the image of in the quotient z mod p, x1 through xn. And each of those for different p's has an F pure threshold. And it turns out that the F pure threshold is always less than a canonical threshold. And let's think about that for a moment from the singularities point of view. In, when, we, when we first of all mod out something, when we, when we take a hyperplane section, we expect the singularities might get worse. Here we modded out P, right? So when we take a hyperplane section, of a singularity, might, singularities might get worse. And in fact, they could get worse. That's kind of what this, in, this um, inequality says. Or another way to think of it is that uh, in characteristic P, the singularities in general, we expect them definitely better than the singularities in characteristic zero, right? So for each, sorry, there's a P missing from this. For each P, the F pure threshold of FP is less than or equal to the log canonical threshold. But what's super cool, that's not too hard to prove, by the way. Um, but what is super interesting is that if I look at, as P goes to infinity, I look at the set of all of these F pure thresholds. I look at the set of all these F pure thresholds as um, P ranges through all the prime ideals. This set, if I take the supremum of it, the supremo is going to be less than or equal to the log canonical threshold, but is actually equal to the log canonical threshold. So put differently, the limit is to infinity will give me the log canonical threshold. Um, so just as an example, let me, let me go back to the singularity we looked at at the beginning. Remember we had y squared minus x cubed. And if I think of this in over C, the log canonical threshold. Anybody know? This is a very famous nope. example. 
Do you mean know what the log canonical threshold is? Yeah. I'll just tell you, it's five, six. It's an exercise in Rob Lazarsfeld's book, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice one. You can compute a resolution of this and from that you can compute the integral where it converges and uh, you can compute it's five, six pretty easily. Now, in characteristic two, so let's say we were over F2 or some other field, the F pure threshold is one half. In characteristic three, which is somehow not quite as singular, which you can think about by computing, for example, the Jacobian ideal and its length. You can see it's like not quite a singular. The F pure threshold is two thirds, a little bit bigger. Remember closer to one means less singular. But both of these numbers are less than the log canonical threshold. So it's more singular in characteristic two than it is in complex numbers and it's more singular in characteristic two than it is in characteristic three. And then you could do it in uh, characteristic P congruent to five mod six. And you'll get five, six minus one over six P. So here you can see as P goes to infinity, we're converging to the long threshold. And just for interest, I'm going to tell you when the characteristic oh, is. So, so I was expecting you just to say it was five, six always, as long as it was not two or three, but yeah. fact, it's not, you're saying, so that's interesting. No, these things are more singular in most characteristics than they are in characteristic zero. And so there's in particular, no, it's not a constructible function. I thought it was going to be some sort of constructible function that just jumped down for two and three, but now it's weird for every single prime. Well, it's interesting when P is one mod six and there's infinitely many of those, the F pure threshold is equal to five, six. So um, it does infinitely many, oftentimes, infinitely many P does hit the same number that it gets in characteristic zero. Um, so so th it's a very interesting number theory kind of effect. It's very closely related to the fact that if you take an elliptic curve, it is super singular for some primes, but infinitely many, and non super singular for infinitely many. It is the same kind of a thing here. So I was expecting also that uh, if, if there, okay, so we don't know, or at least some of us don't know if we have resolution of singularities and positive characteristic, but, uh, right. but, <laughs> but, but if, the, but if you happen to have, um, but sometimes resolutions exist. And I yes. thought you were going to tell me that if a resolution exists and for y squared minus x cubed, there is a resolution yes. away from that's not, that you would compute it in some way. But now yes. you're saying, no, that's not true. Well, if resolution, because it's binomial, it's a toric variety, basically. And, it, and so you can compute everything. But the, the, the problem is it would tell you the number you would get from that if you tried to do an analogous thing would always be five six. And right. it doesn't capture the it doesn't capture the subtleties of the singularities in characteristic P. The F pure threshold is much better. It's capturing the subtleties of the singularities in characteristic P. Great. Okay, so that's what's going on. Um, maybe I do another example, Robbie, even though I'm I'm worried I'm gonna run out of time, but that's okay, because I don't have to tell you every single theorem anyway. But just because maybe this is a more familiar example. If I take it, if I take a um cubic like this. I, I moved to page seven. Let's take a cubic um, and think of it as a cone over an elliptic curve. Well, here the F pure threshold, well, actually let's dispose, if F is three, that's the worst singular, that's the most singular. If F is, if the characteristic is three, it's of course um, one third because then it's just the cube of a linear form. Right, we already said a cube of a linear form. Remember that would be one over the power. We had that, I don't know if you remember, but it was one of the properties I said about um, simple normal crossing support divisors. But um, in the F pure threshold of F is one if, um, if this is super singular. We're all characteristic P where F is ordinary, I mean. 
and it's f p t f is one minus one over p if f is super singular. So that's just another rule. It's a I know because the number theory people might be familiar with super singularity, um, and this is equivalent to saying that the Remember I said that F pure threshold being one tells us that the cone, that the ring is Frobenius split. So this is where it's Frobenius split. And this is where it's not Frobenius split. I mean, just to give another example. So you can see this function is quite subtle and it's capturing something subtle about the singularities in characteristic P. By the way, what's the log canonical threshold if we were over complex numbers here? Everybody should know from the previous theorem. <laughs> That's your quiz. The, like the, the limit as P goes to infinity of the F pure thresholds gives us the log canonical threshold, right? The limit. So the, the log canonical threshold would be one. And that's because a cone over a cone over elliptic curve in, co in complex numbers is a log canonical singularity. That's everybody's favorite example of a log canonical singularity usually. All right. Um, I want to tell you my theorem now, my the theorem that I'm most excited about. Um, I know we only have a few more minutes, so I won't tell you everything there is to know about it. And I certainly won't tell you the proof of it. But the idea is this, we can sort of have, you can go to page eight, Ravi. We can have, um, you know, arbitrarily bad singularities if we allow arbitrary multiplicity. We have a multiplicity million singularity, it's gonna be very singular no matter what. But if we fix the multiplicity, we might ask, among all singularities of multiplicity D, what is the most singular singularity? So let me now state a theorem. And before I even state the theorem, um, let me tell you the way we're gonna measure the most singular singularity is we're going to prove a lower bound on the F pure threshold in terms of the multiplicity. And then we're going to investigate what singularities achieve that smallest possible F pure threshold. So, so what are the rules of the game? Like, could like uh, D times, uh, are you like, can it be non-reduced and just be like as non-reduced as possible? To, let's stick to reduced. Let's okay. stick to reduced. And isolated? So no, that doesn't matter. That's Okay, I said, so only thing is generically reduced, it is reduced, sorry. Reduced, yeah, let me, let me state it. Let me state the theorem. So F is gonna be reduced. Um, and I'm gonna state this only for homogeneous. Uh, degree D. So this is a multiplicity D singularity and it's reduced. Then here's the theorem and it's care P. So the theorem is that the F pure threshold of F, so you remember that it's always bounded by one over D, bounded below by one over D. I proved that, maybe it wasn't so clear, but I did prove it. But what it's actually true, and which is new and not at all obvious or known, is that it's always bounded in this reduced case by one over D minus one. Hmm. And that actually is pretty hard, uh, three pages of analysis much more than I showed you on the previous slide, plus some other tricks. But there's more to this theorem, which is that we can say exactly when equality holds. And with equality holding, equality, if and only if, F is very special. So very special in this case, I mean that F has degree P to the E plus one. So P is the characteristic. So I'm taking a power of P and adding one and is in this Frobenius power of the ideal. Remember, this is the ideal generated 
by the P to the E powers of the generators. So there's sort of two theorems here. Actually, the paper, there's definitely two theorems proven because they have different techniques for each. There's this bound, there's a lower bound on the F pure threshold, holds for any reduced polynomial homogeneous of degree D. And then we separately prove what happens when F has F pure threshold equal to one over D minus one. Another way to write that let me write this down. This is IE. This means I could write F in this form. F has the form X1P to some linear form, right? It's in the ideal generated by the P to the powers, and it has degree P to the E plus one. So these coefficients have to be linear forms. Where, L, where the allies are linear. Does the statement of the theorem make sense? This is really so, my main message to you. Okay. It does. And where does the homogeneous, so, so would you expect, given that you've got the worst case and it can't get any worse, you might think you'd even be able to guess what would be true even if it we're not homogeneous. That it has to yeah, start like we, this. Yeah. We don't have a theorem in the local case when it's not homogeneous. We don't have a theorem yet. But do you have a guess? Do you, do you know I, do actually, we, we, do, we do believe that we do not, that this is not true. So my original guess was I could replace the, the D by the multiplicity. When, when, right. when F is homogeneous to degree D, its multiplicity is D. And my original guess is that we could replace this by the multiplicity, but we have counterexamples to that. Hmm. So in the local case, we do not know what's going on. In the local case, we don't know. But What's super cool about this, so our paper on this topic, you know, half of it is this kind of analysis, um, trying to prove this bound where we're looking at supremums of different sets and using different tricks. And then the second half we study characterizing. So I want to, I want to state a few other theorems here. So if, I, I want to say, look, I'm going to make a definition. So a, a form, a homogeneous polynomial, is a Frobenius form, basically, if it has this form we just write, wrote, if it is of the form x1 p to the e l1, xn p to the e ln. So these l's are linear. And let me point out that this, there's some very cool linear algebra you can do here. We can factor this as matrix Uh, you know, this is a one by n matrix of the p powers of the f's, and then I can put the l's here. Right, that's just matrix multiplication. And then I can also write those, that matrix of linear forms. I'm teaching linear algebra this semester, so very familiar to me, as a times this. And this a is now just some n by n matrix. with coefficients in the ground field. And this is very similar to the theory of quadratic forms. And actually, let's point out that a very, very special case, a very, very special case is quadratic forms. Because if D has character, if D is two, then I can take E to be zero, right? P to the E is one. So I, this is just how I write a quadratic form. So why are you, uh, you I see, so D, D is two, but P is anything. Yes, yes, right. that's right. Um, but that's a very special case because quadratic polynomials, we like to think of them as the least singular thing, right? They're, they're, they're like, you know, besides being smooth or maybe being a simple normal crossing, uh, uh, the singularity defined by just a nice, let's say isolated, uh, quadratic is, is not very singular at all. And, but that's fine because it's, it's the both, you know, in this case, the F pure threshold is one, which is simultaneously the least and the most it can be. Remember the F pure threshold is always less than or equal to one. And this bound is telling us that it's always greater than or equal to one. So it's equal to one for the quadratic case. Um, 
So this n by n matrix, though, if p is if e is greater than one, this is unique. If e is greater than greater than zero, I mean, because then it's corresponding to the coefficient of x i the p e times x j that a j piece, right? And that that's those are all unique. It's not unique when in the in when when e is zero. That's the quadratic form case. Maybe so, you're about to say this, Karen. Yeah. But if you fix an embedding dimension and a degree, yes. can you figure out for what pro characteristics these um, extremal singularities might exist? Yes, exactly. In fact, let me see that theorem on the next page. Um, Ravi, your seminar ends at four. Um, I, it's already four. I feel bad. Um, do you want to go over by five minutes? I, I'm actually teaching at four. Well, officially I'm teaching right now, but I moved forward by half an hour. Uh, uh, do you want to go on for like another, say, five minutes? I'll go on and, and five minutes. I state, I want to state two theorems. I want to okay. answer Juliet's question. So, if we, so we know that there's finitely many. I'm on page nine. Up to change of coordinates, of course. Um, in each embedding, in each fixed embedding dimension. So that's the N and degree. The degree has to be P to the E plus one, but it, that really doesn't matter because we can sort of list them all out and the embedding dimension is the only thing that matters. And in fact, the number of them number of Frobenius forms up to change of coordinates is bounded by the nth Fibonacci number. It's kind of a cute little proof for that's true. Um, if, if, you, if you restrict to an isolated case, there's exactly one. And it is this one. I mean, th this one is obviously a Frobenius form. And, you know, I'm writing it as x1 to the p to the e times the linear form x1. This is, this is obviously of that form. So these are the singularities with an isolated singularity that maximally possible singular from the point of view of um, the f pure threshold. So among what's, your hypothesis, what's your hypothesis on the, the base field is, is uh, characteristic P anything, but, but that's it because what if it's not perfect? Oh, to get the isolated, to get the finitely many, we need that the field is algebraically closed. Great. Yeah. So you have to, you have to pass to the algebraic closer to change coordinates. Um, these should not be confused with a thing that's called Hermitian forms in characteristic P where we assume the matrix has the property that AIJ is the pth power of AJI. That's a very special different thing that was studied in the 30s actually. And this, um, this is different. Um, Janos got confused when he read our paper because he thought we were doing that, but we were not doing that. And I don't I didn't, think- I didn't realize Janos, I could believe he would have read all the papers in the 30s, but I didn't realize he ever got confused. Yeah, he did. I think there's a little mini, in his paper, but he was vague enough that it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, nobody can pin him down on it. But we had some back and forth this summer about that because it's an old paper of um, an old paper of um, Wit and um, oh gosh, another German mathematician. It's in German, so I can't really read it. And apparently, there's a lot of confusion about this paper because I found some other papers in the literature correcting other people's misunderstandings about this paper. And anyway, ours is totally independent of all of that stuff. So. Anyway, this is, the, this is the thing I wanted to say about that. And the other very, very cool thing about it, I'm gonna to go to page 10 to state one theorem. So if I look at the hypersurface defined, let's take a hypersurface. So let's say it's extremal if it defines, you know, if, it, if it's, if the um, F pure threshold of F is achieving that minimal possible bound that lower bound, 
and this is this is an extremal if and only if every hyperplane section is extremal. And this is really cool because we can use this to say that if I have an extremal hypersurface and I take a plane section, intersect it with a plane, so it's a two-dimensional linear subspace in Pn, then this has no triangles. <laughs> It cannot be a configuration of lines like that. So, for example, if I take a cubic surface in characteristic two, in page 11, if, if I have a cubic surface, cubic surface in char two, defined by this equation, that's a nice smooth cubic surface and it's extremal in the sense that it has the smallest possible f pure threshold. Sorry, I keep messing up the variables. You know the theorem about this, we know it has 27 lines. They never so, form so, a triangle. So does that, so you mean that they are always asterisks or yes, that they're double? Yes. Yes, right. Yes. Now that thing was probably known by people. I couldn't find anybody who knew it, but like when I tried to find references for it, people like a Zet could give me a proof directly, you know, in characteristic two. This is very special to characteristic two. So they never, they, so the 27 lines never form a triangle. I think Janos knew that. I'm sure he did. It's a very pretty, you know, we prove it from some very general thing about any, in any, any dimension, doesn't have to be characteristic two, you know, we, any plane section of an extreme hypersurface never contains triangles. And then we just said, oh, this includes cubic surfaces in characteristic two. And so then I went around looking if someone knew that and um, is that could prove it. And I didn't ask Janos, maybe I should have, but, but and I also proved it directly just using like Hartshorn style. It's a good exercise. So you, they always form an asterisk. That's called an Eckhart plane. I think it's a question from Juliet. Yeah. Do you need, does it work over, so your previous theorem, is that true over finite fields? It seems like you might have problems if you only have a few hypersurfaces to intersect or hyperplanes to intersect. With. No, I'm working over a character. I'm working over algebraically closed here. Okay. I'm working over algebraically closed. I mean, there's a lot you can say when you're not algebraically closed, but I haven't bothered to do that in this talk. <laughs> but you're right. Like for the, for these statements, you want to have, you want, you want to have, uh, you want to have all, all the points that you want to have. Yeah, so I'm very sorry I went over. We got started late and we got technological issues, but thank you for listening. Great. Well, thank you. Everyone can unmute and, uh, and we can thank Karen for a great talk. <laughs>